Hey folks, today we're going to be having a look back at the GTX 660 Ti. Now this is the same card which I bought a week or so back with sticking fans, a tendency to overheat and shut off mid-game on top of a misflash BIOS. This card cost me next to nothing but a good one in working order on eBay is going to set you back between £50 and £60 pounds or $60 and $70. Dollars. The 660 Ti is quite a curious card. Back in 2012, Nvidia had a bit of a problem on its hands. Following the launch of the GTX 680, and with the exception of the very budget orientated GTX 640, all the GeForce 600 series cards were targeting the high end, where, to be fair, they were excelling. The trouble was, and is still the case today, that the majority of gamers don't want or can't afford to game in that area. This problem was compounded with production. Nvidia wanted to sell as much GK104 based GTX 670 and 680 cards as they could since these cards made a lot of profit for them. Production wise the cost to produce the 640 and the 680 is actually pretty similar and creating a performance variant suitable for a $300 price tag based on one of the smaller GPUs would mean less production of the much more profitable GK104 GPU. So with that in mind, Nvidia released the GTX 660 Ti, a cut down GTX 670, which in itself is a cut down version of the GTX 680. Now I've talked in other videos about the process of binning where silicon, which does not quite meet the quality requirements of a top tier product, is binned down and released as a lower tier product. We see this today with the GTX 1070 and the 1080 or the RX 570 and 580, and it was the same half a decade ago. So with this, and without wanting to sound too inception y, cut down version of a cut down version of a flagship GPU, Nvidia had their mid range contender, and we got a GPU with 1344 CUDA cores, 112 TMUs, 24 ROPs, and 2 GB of GDDR5 memory on a 192 bit memory interface. At stock, the card almost boosts to around 1 GHz, and the memory has an effective speed of just over 6 GHz. But how does it fare now? Coupled to the i5-4590 and 8GB of DDR3 RAM, we're starting things off in GTA 5 at 1080p on the high preset, with the lower of the anti-aliasing options FXAA turned on. Here we averaged out just over 60fps, and the average minimums were hovering around about the 50fps mark. A good solid gaming experience here. Keeping with the open world tests in Fallout 4 at 1080p on the high preset, with some of the more fancy and demanding effects scaled back or set to low. On average, the card returned just over 50fps, and just under 40fps on the average minimums. It is easy enough to find a good mix of settings if you're dead set on 60fps though, and this still keeps the visual quality well above the console variants of the game. Crisis 3 now, and running through the first few chapters of the game again at 1080p and on the high preset, we averaged out in the mid 50s with the average minimums in the low 40s. There was no severe dips here, and even at its lowest, the game was not jarring. Another nice showing for this old budget card. Battlefield 1 now at 1080p on the high preset, and we couldn't actually hit an average of 60fps, which is not really surprising. But the average minimums did stay above 40fps and it wasn't hard just to dial back a few of that settings and see the frame rates jump up. Now on to Prey, Bethesda's recently released sci-fi horror FPS, and a title which seems to be favouring Nvidia hardware. Here the GTX 660 Ti, it performed really well at 1080p on the high setting, but with the AA scaled back to FXAA, we returned an average frame rate of 59 FPS, and the average minimums of 44. Now this sounds great but it should be noted that on these settings, texture popping was pretty terrible. Dropping to the medium preset, which still looks really good, the game worked absolutely flawlessly, and we've seen the average frame rate jump up to 70 FPS, and the average minimums actually hovered around 60, which is an absolute fantastic showing for a 5 year old mid range card on a new AAA title. Now finishing things off we have the last two Tomb Raider games, unsurprisingly in the 2013 reboot and on the ultra settings, the 660 Ti absolutely blitzed through, averaging over 80fps, and the average minimums were tickling 70fps. In the newer Rise of the Tomb Raider, again the GTX 660 Ti coped well. At 1080p on the high preset, with FXAA turned on, we've seen averages of 49fps, and the average minimums hovered around about 26. Although, as I've mentioned in other tests, turning down the graphical settings just a little 
really helps the frame rates and certainly does not detract from the looks of the game. That said though, if you're fine with a constant level 30fps lock, there's certainly scope here to push up the eye candy much further. So all in all, the GTX 660 Ti, it puts in a good show, and for £50 or so, it's a decent option, and it's still more than capable of providing a good 1080p gaming experience, providing you don't aim for too high a setting. The only real drawback here is the Kepler architecture. When released, this card went toe-to-toe -to -toe with the HD 7950, a card which you also may know as the vanilla R9280. And while it was more than a match back then, today the AMD card is considerably faster. As with the GTX 770, which I tested last year, in older titles, Kepler cards are absolutely fantastic, but the neglect on the software side from Nvidia has meant that in newer titles, they may be found wanting. As such, opting for a newer Maxwell based card if you can stretch that budget a little bit, or a card from the red team, is likely going to get you a card which is going to stay relevant for a little longer. All in all though, it's still an impressive performer, and one card that I think would sit very nicely in my Core 2 Quad system. But I'll leave it there folks, thanks for watching this, and a big thanks to all the new subscribers over the last month or so, the support has absolutely blown my way. As always, take care, and I'll see you down in the comment section below and in the next video.